Hello everyone. Once again, this is Pastor Terry Reese of the Valley Grace Brethren Church of Armall, Pennsylvania. And once again, it is indeed our high privilege that you have chosen to spend some of your precious allotted time on this earth to share it with us for this time of study and reflection. And we trust that you'll receive a blessing uh, having invested this time with us. Um, I'm on the uh, fourth session now of our ongoing series entitled um, 11 Scriptures that today's empowered elites would rather you not know. And again, we're talking about the general trends of our times, talking about the best and the brightest, the controlling influences in our society, Today's uh, post-modern, they don't uh, really affirm the overall, the whole concept of truth. Post-Christian, they've gone beyond Christianity. Pragmatic, whatever works is good, kind of elites. Post-modern, post-Christian, pragmatic humanists. That's the central ideology, it seems, of our time. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on recap. Uh, our basic format is to take 11 scriptures as kind of a jumping off point, kind of an outline in terms of uh, underscoring where today's elites are out of sync with the Word of God. We went through uh, f uh, five such scriptures and we're just going to pick up today. If you haven't seen the prior messages, we invite you to do so as we're kind of building a theme here. But today we're going to pick up on verse number 6. Deals with the topic, a very popular topic today, very controversial topic, the topic of climate change. Man-made climate change. The climate crisis. And my scripture that I've chosen is, for reflection, a scripture today's elites would rather you not know about, is Isaiah chapter 51, verse 3, deals with the millennial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. There we read, So the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all those who live among its ruins. He will make its desert like Eden. He will make its wilderness like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the sound of singing. You know, friends, uh, this deals with the future Eden-like conditions which will prevail during the millennium. This is prophecy. The scriptures cannot be broken. This will happen. This isn't a possible potential outcome. This will happen. The Lord Jesus Christ will make the desert bloom. The entire climate a planet Earth will be changed, transformed, transformed into something productive, something beneficial. That's the kind of climate change I think, uh, think we can look forward to and embrace. And it's coming. A new world's a coming. Now, you think about the uh, kind of hysterical mindset that today's progressives are locked into. It's become kind of a religious dogma, that we're facing the end, we're facing planetary doom, unless we're all driving electric cars, EVs, by the year 2030 or 2035 or whatever, we're doomed. You know, I, I think back to 2019 as kind of a, a picture that, uh, that really, uh, I think, stands as an epitome of this kind of mindset. You remember back then, there was this UN Climate Action Summit, and a 16-year-old Swedish girl in a, 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 
a veteran climate activist at age 16 named Greta Thunberg took the stage and she scolded this world's leaders for taking her childhood away from her, leaving her under the cloud of climate change disaster. She, she cried out, How dare you! How dare you! You have taken my childhood from me! How dare you! How dare you! You know, her whole life had been ruined, so she says, because of the specter of man-made climate change. How tragic. And she's kind of made a cottage industry. Uh, you know, she's now in her 20s of um, progressive activism. She's now expanded into the pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian cause. She's condemning Israel. By the way, that'll be the topic for one of our future um, future uh, sessions. Um, but she, uh, she's perpetually scolding this or that world leader. Uh, I kind of like the response of the former uh, uh, president of Brazil, a great guy, a populist, populist conservative, uh, President Bolsonaro, who got tired of listening to his country being scolded by this girl, and uh, he, uh, he referred to her as, uh, quote, a brat, unquote. And I think that's uh, sadly accurate. I mean, here's a girl who uh, forced her mother an opera singer to uh, give up her career as an opera singer because um, uh, her traveling around the world was leaving too big of a climate footprint. You know, who, who wears the pants in that family? Obviously, it's not the parents. But, uh, you know, this girl, I don't mean to pick on her. She has a number of psychological difficulties, uh, quite a number, actually. But the point is she's being used used as a front by a radical worldwide movement that has captured the hearts of the entire progressive movement. Radical environmentalism, the green movement. For years now, we've been, uh, I mean years, decades, we have been subject to uh, outlandish but nonetheless dogmatic climate change narratives, uh, all of which, uh, frankly, lie entirely outside of the domain of the scientific method. I mean, you think about the scientific method. That deals with which it, that which is observable, repeatable. Um, you, know, you can do experiments. You can test your hypothesis. You have people today talking about how the climate was 2,000 years ago. You know, how the climate was back in the days of the Roman Empire. Really? And even worse than that, they talk about uh, uh, what the climate will be like 3,000 years in the future. Really? Is that within the domain of the scientific method? Testifiable, repeatable science? and yet it's become dogma. You know, in the end, friends, you're dealing here with something akin to religious dogma rather than science. But um, throughout my life, you know, going back to the time when I was a kid in the 70s, we heard about the specter of a new ice age. A new ice age is coming. And then it was changed to uh, global warming. You remember old Al Gore, global warming. That was his favorite expression. Global warming, as he would put it. The greenhouse effect. By the way, would the greenhouse effect be bad? Remember uh, in the days of the early earth, the great canopy that was created in the second day of creation, the separation of the waters from the waters, the vapor canopy which gave earth a tranquil, uniform climate that was highly pleasant, this vapor canopy collapsing at the time of the Great Flood, resulting in a much harsher climate. I don't know, would a greenhouse effect really be that bad? But nonetheless, we're, uh, we hear these hysterical narratives about uh, the seas are boiling. Last time I saw, saw 
old Al Gore, he was talking about boiling seas. I guess you don't even need a pot to cook your lobster. Um, all this hysterical rhetoric. And they want to make monumental societal changes. Get rid of your gas dryer, your gas stove, etc., etc. They want to do things that will impoverish the American people, cause widespread uh, uh, social disruption. Think about the third world, young nations that are trying to uh, catch up in terms of their industrial activity. How's it going to affect them? How's it going to affect uh, trucking in this country? Electric big rigs? You know, I mean, think about the implications of all this. But uh, this is what we hear about today, climate change. Um, you saw it in the recent uh, vice presidential debate, by the way, between Mr. Waltz and Senator uh, Vance. You had this know-it-all CBS reporter, Noah, uh, Nora O'Donnell, typical representative elite. And uh, she, with great dogmatism, affirmed that these recent storms, like the ones that just hit North Carolina, are the direct result of man-made climate change. Now, think about that. You're seeing politicians and elite figures, journalists, claiming that this or that storm that occurred a month ago or a week ago, it's proven, scientifically proven, that that's the direct result of climate change? Really? Where's the science in this? The provable science. The answer is it's not there. It's politics you're dealing with. Uh, it's religion, something in the sphere of religious faith you're dealing with. But uh, nonetheless, she was very dogmatic about this, despite, despite recorded data that today's storm activity, by the way, is not intensifying. That's an inconvenient fact. But nonetheless, Nora O'Donnell interjected herself into the vice presidential debate as if we really cared what she thinks about anything. I, I wanted to hear Mr. Vance's views. I wanted to hear Mr. Waltz's views. I don't really care what Nora O'Donnell thinks. You know, frankly, I hope the, the next debate they have, they don't even use a moderator. They just get in the way. But uh, nonetheless, you know, you, you, we're told that unless we fo follow Greta Thunberg, and David Attenborough, another big climate change guy, Al Gore, John Kerry, you know, the elite John Kerry, our, uh, our climate czar who travels the world in big jets and says, well, it's justified because who I am, my importance to the planet. You know, he's leaving the biggest climate footprint of anybody. Uh, Senator Ed Markey and his uh, cohort AOC, the two... Uh, co-sponsors of the Green New Deal, what Donald Trump accurately calls the Green New Scam. Um, you know, unless we, uh, unless we follow these people, uh, we're doomed. Done for. That's today's political dogma. Friends, here's the deal. This movement uh, really is a Trojan horse that's uh, really... What it's really about is not so much about science or climate. Uh, it's about political control. You know, I mean, think about the political control that these people will have in terms of uh, once they have the power to get rid of your gas stove or force you to insulate your house or whatever. Think of the raw power it will give these people. So it's a political thing. Um, and also, it's a religious thing. You have these uh, deep ecologists. That's one branch of today's environmental movement that sees the Earth as a living organism, as the goddess Gaia. It's a neo-pagan worldview. And that's what this is, uh, this is about in many quarters. Either it's about political control, or it's pseudoscientific quackery, or it's about uh, neo-paganism. And that's what it's about. It's not about the environment. Not really. Fortunately, before you, uh, you wring your hands and think, oh, I'm going to be dead in uh, 10 years unless we're all driving electric cars, 
Let's think about what God has revealed in his word about what earth's true future is. Do you know uh, the Bible is a book of prophecy? And what does the Bible say about what we should look forward to? What is our actual future? Next thing on the agenda, friends, is something called the rapture. That's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. That's the harpazo, the uh, snatching away uh, that's talked about in that verse. The rapture is in the Bible. And uh, the, uh, by the way, that Greek term is translated in the Latin Vulgate as raptura. That's where we get the English word rapture from. So the word actually is there. Um, this is the rescue of God's people from the wrath that is to come. And we're talking about the Great Tribulation. We believe, uh, we know that the Bible teaches that the rapture, the snatching away of the elect, of the dead in Christ, and of those who are, who are alive and remain, as discussed by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, this thing that will happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's also discussed in 1 Corinthians 15. This, uh, this event will precede the great tribulation period. God's church will be snatched away and join the Lord in the air and shall ever be with him. And we will enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19. God's people for the first time in history, will be all assembled at one place together, one glorious meeting with the Lord. Think about that. Today, the saints are separated by many things, by death, by historical eras, by location, by not getting along. But on that day, we will all be together, finally, at one place. The bride of Christ, the unified bride of Christ with the bridegroom. And uh, this will be our rescue from the wrath that is to come. Paul talks about that again in the, Thess the first Thessalonian epistle, chapter 1, verse 10, chapter 5, verse 9. This is the wrath that is to come. The next event then in earth's future will be the great tribulation. Seven years of the outpouring of divine wrath upon this earth, the breaking of the seven seals by the Lamb, who has the authority to break these seals, and all manner of terrifying judgments, supernatural judgments, will fall upon the earth. Friends, you read the book of Revelation, you read about things like giant hailstones, the seas being turned into blood, monster earthquakes, one that's described that will bring down all the cities of this world, Astounding, but these are supernaturally directed judgments. This isn't just uh, some naturalistic uh, event. This isn't simply the wrath of man. These are supernaturally directed judgments. Judgments upon a world that is without God. At this point, uh, then, at the end of the seven years, our Lord Jesus Christ returns as the Davidic, the Davidic conquering Messiah, Revelation 19. He will uh, take possession of this world. And that's what, by the way, the breaking of the seals is about in Revelation 5. It is, uh, that document represents uh, Satan's eviction orders, essentially. It's the title deed to planet Earth. And uh, he uh, returns to earth. His feet will touch the Mount of Olives, uh, Zechariah 14, and he will indeed be enthroned as the Davidic king. And uh, that's when the kingdom begins. Sometimes we talk about the kingdom as though we're a present thing, but the fact is right now we're, uh, as we win people to the Lord, we are winning people who will be citizens of the kingdom, but the kingdom does not begin properly until Jesus returns and establishes his throne, his Davidic throne in Jerusalem. That is the, what's known as the classical dispensational view, and it is the biblical view. This is how the scriptures refer to the kingdom. 
the uh, kingdom age of Old Testament expectation will be fulfilled. Uh, Revelation 20 specifies that this kingdom age will endure a thousand years, a millennium. And during this time, Jesus will renew the earth. Remember, our focus is on climate change, okay? Jesus will renew the earth, even the disasters of the Great Tribulation, which will change the entire topography of planet earth, will not bring about doom, okay? The earth will be salvaged. Jesus will renew the earth. The earth will be transformed into a veritable garden of Eden. Peace, prosperity, universal justice, all those things that we, our hearts desire but are elusive to us today, all these things will be a reality under his reign. The nations will be ruled under the rod of iron, and uh, even the animal kingdom, we will see the rollback of the, uh, the curse, at least in part. The animals will once again become peaceable, and they will once again uh, enter a vegetarian state, like we saw in Genesis chapter 1, where the animals were given the green herb, the plant, for food. You know this uh, about the lion and the lamb and the little child will lead them. Uh, Eden-like conditions on this earth. So friends, climate change, man-made climate change, is not going to be, is not earth's future. It's not going to bring an end to life on this planet. You know, that's, that notion stands in utter defiance a biblical prophecy. Do you believe the prophetic utterances of the word of God or don't you? And I'm not saying we should be careless with the environment or we shouldn't be good uh, stewards with that which God has given us, these wonderful natural resources or any of that. But I'm saying that's, uh, let's understand that God, there is a future, a programmed future for planet Earth. And by the way, the disasters of the Great Tribulation period will pave the way for the glories of the millennial kingdom, uh, the changed topography of the earth as a result of all this seismic activity, these monster earthquakes, uh, will have a leveling effect. Uh, you know, today we live on a planet of extremes, high mountains like the Himalayans, which are not conducive to productive human activity. You know, all these things emerged after the flood, which also changed the topography of the earth. By the way, online I have a, uh, a series I did a couple years ago on the five earths, that is five uh, different regimes in which we see this earth having undergone monumental changes. You might want to check back into that in terms of the story of how the tribulation period and its disasters and geologic upheavals will pave the way for the glory of the millennium. But after the millennium, after the thousand years, will come then the eternal state. Uh, the, with fervent heat, the elements will melt. You know, 2 Peter 3 talks about these things. This is an act of God. The uh, millennium, though glorious, is not the perfected state. It must give way to the final consummate state in which the curse is fully removed, in which you have a perfect earth um, inhabited by, glor by nothing but glorified men. And uh, the world will be entirely reconstituted. Um, that world, the scriptures speak of very movingly. You know, if you're sitting around worried about climate change like Greta Thunberg, Think of, wrap your brains around Revelation 21, verses 1 and 4. Listen to these beautiful words. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Friends, aren't you glad that's the future that God has in mind for those who love him? That is the future of planet Earth. I'm sorry to burst Al Gore's bubble. I'm sorry to burst Greta Thunberg's bubble and John Kerry's and AOC's and Ed Markey's and David Attenborough and all these climate change fanatics. But that's the reality of our future. Thank God. Well, that brings me then to a seventh verse, which we have time for yet today. Um, it deals with the purpose of human secular government. You know, the political realm uh, talks a lot about uh, government, what government should be doing, what all the politicians are promising, what they're going to do. Um, what does God say they should be doing? Well, here's a passage for you. Romans chapter 13, verse 4. It is a minister of God to you for good. Paul's talking about the government. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Several similar passages, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Peter uh, says this to Christians. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Or uh, think about uh, uh, an earlier scripture that's really uh, foundational to all of those. Genesis chapter 9. This takes place after the great flood. Noah and his, his sons offer the appropriate sacrifices in worship for God's deliverance. Um, God uh, speaks. He, uh, he inaugurates the rainbow covenant with Noah and his sons, and there's various provisions attached to that which uh, will make life a lot less hostile than the violent world uh, which uh, Noah and his sons knew before the flood. God says in Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6, Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. Unquote. Again, the context of that, uh, that statement is that uh, prior to the flood, utter chaos reigned upon the earth. Apparently, what, whatever justice there was was dispensed by clans or by individuals. It was chaos. You uh, have the awful account in Genesis chapter 4 of Lamech, a descendant of Cain who dispensed his own so-called justice. A young man... Uh, rushed against him, and Lamech uh, responds, responds by, with murder, and he sings his awful song, the song of the sword, to his two wives, brags about his murderous deeds. This was the kind of world that existed prior to the institution of human government after the flood. What a nightmare of chaos. Uh, the Lord God looked down upon the earth and he saw that it was covered with violence and he regretted that he, he had even made man. What a, what a poignant comment that is. But it uh, demonstrates the need for order, social order. This is why God has placed the sword in the king's hand as described in Romans 
13. And this is, you, you see this passage in Genesis 9. There God authorizes capital punishment to be dispensed by a human authority. Notice it is by the hand of man that the, uh, the murderer will be punished. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. All of this uh, is the seed of human civil government. You need an authority to execute this capital punishment, and this, of course, is the germ of uh, Romans 13. Um, capital punishment. This is an act of mercy in God's part. It's uh, something that is designed to make a divine de de declaration that human life is sacred, and it's also designed to, uh, uh, to bring about social order because of it has a deterrent effect. Um, capital punishment is the only just, appropriate, proportional punishment when you're dealing with homicide. Um, a murderer has struck down, tempted to destroy that which was created in the image and likeness of God. Human life is sacred. What other punishment is proportional? Do we just slap a person's wrist like sometimes we do today? What does that say about the value of the life of the person that was murdered? It says that we don't really value it very much, do we? This being soft on murderers. Friends, there is no other fit proportional punishment. And uh, it is a deterrent if done in a timely and, yes, public manner. This is how it was done in the days of the law, the law, uh, the law of Moses, where capital punishment was uh, often prescribed as the, uh, the the just sentence. Look at such scriptures as Deuteronomy thirteen eleven, Deuteronomy twenty one twenty one. There we're told that all Israel will see what happens to the murder, and they will fear, and they will not do such a thing. Yes, this uh, foolish debate whether or not capital punishment is a deterrent should be settled by the Word of God. The Word of God says that it is. Good enough for me. I don't need any sociological studies. Um, and yet, in the, uh, you know, it, it, this is the... Uh, the directive God gives to all nations, to all governments on the face of the earth, and throughout most of human history, even pagan nations have instinctively understood the necessity and the justice behind capital punishment. But yet, in our modern, advanced, progressive, post-enlightenment uh, culture, now we we know better. You know, it was only since the Enlightenment that this idea um, got in the air that somehow capital punishment is inhumane. It's bad. You saw various European rulers uh, uh, start to think about capital punishment in a different way. Like, for example, uh, the Tsarina Elizabeth of Russia outlawed capital punishment in the 1700s. And it reflected the new Enlightenment mindset where we're looking outside of God's words, uh, God's word for uh, a source of authority and wisdom. Um, the, uh, today, the uh, progressive liberal state seeks to do pretty much everything except protect its people. The one thing that God, the main thing that God has called upon the state to do, punish evildoers, administer justice. That's the number one mandate for human government. Not guiding society in terms of its views on gay marriage, not uh, providing a nanny state, not this, not that. No, uh, all these th wonderful things that we think government should be doing, not uh, legalizing pot, 
not uh, protecting your right to an abortion, not uh, encouraging you to be a deadbeat in your student loans. Those are the three things, by the way, that progressives are running on right now. Canceling out student loan debts, telling you that if you borrowed money, you don't have to pay it back. Uh, you should have your free. You should have your legal drugs. Some European states, by the way, even uh, I notice even provide free drugs for addicts. Um, all these things, you know, that uh, the progressive enlightened state wants to do, but the one thing they don't want to do: protect their people, administer justice. Look at our open borders. How are we doing now in terms of protecting our people? That's where the uh, enlightened progressives are failing. They don't even understand the basic responsibilities of government. Well, friends, with that, I'm going to uh, break off now in the, uh, the interest of time. Next week, we're going to finish this uh, series out, or we're going to attempt to. And uh, until next time, friends, this is uh, Pastor Terry Reese, again, reminding you what this series is about. Those, th those scriptures that today's enlightened elites don't want you to know about, but God does. So until next time, friends, this is uh, Pastor Terry Reese. May the Lord be with you.